sequence around Ultima Thule. Well, this all starts with the New Horizons mission to Pluto, sent out there by NASA to do a flyby of Pluto and Sharon in 2015 and take some fantastic images and did lots of other work as well, discovered that there were more satellites out there, more moons of Pluto, and uh, Pluto was a really surprising world. And it was all made possible because NASA had an extra lump of plutonium to use as a power source left over from the Cassini mission that flew to Saturn. But the question was, having visited the Pluto system and taken the marvelous images and sent them back home to Earth for analysis, what do you do with the spacecraft? It was going extremely fast. It had done a flyby of Jupiter to pick up a gravity assist on its way out to the outer solar system and was the fastest moving object that uh, mankind had ever made up to that point. So it couldn't stop. It hadn't got the fuel to slow down and go into orbit around Pluto or really do anything but keep going in a pretty much a straight line. Um, it couldn't have gone and explored any of the other Kuiper Belt objects like Eris or Huame or any of the other big ones that we knew about because they were around the other side of the solar system. So the question was, could we find anything else that it could possibly go and visit just using the little bit of spare fuel that it had left? And so a search for potential targets was set up. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope had discovered this one, this little tiny moving dot, which has got the green ring around it for your convenience, um, in a series of images here. It's not very spectacular, but this little tiny space rock was given the designation 2014 for its year of discovery and MU69, the catalogue number for the item during that year. And this was in roughly the right direction and seemed plausible. So this was given the designation PT1, potential target one. And in fact, I can stop the motion here for you and show just uh, five frames superimposed on each other. There's PT1, MU69 whizzing across. And uh, it's quite a small object. The estimate based on the sort of image and the brightness here was that it was roughly 30 kilometers in diameter. So really quite a tiny object um, and somewhat irregular in shape. You can just about make that out in that image there. Now, in fact, there were several objects. There was a PT2 and a PT3 that were found all in orbits beyond the uh, realm of Neptune out in the Kuiper belt, intersecting roughly with the outside edge of Pluto's orbit, but in somewhat more circular paths, taking just under 300 years to go right round. And uh, well, here's the orbit of PT-1, and PT-1 was selected. So there's the purple track going past Pluto and then past PT-1. And it had just enough fuel to allow it to do that and carry out this close flyby on the 1st of January 2019. Now they held a public consultation uh, to try and come up with a name for it and 34,000 different names were suggested by 115,000 people um, but the one that had the most scored 40 of those and it was Ultima Thule. Uh, Thule was a mythical island in the North Sea that ancient people thought was present. And Ultima Thule meant beyond Thule, a mysterious place outside the known world. So this made some sense for this tiny little uh, outpost of the solar system. But the problem was trying to pin it down and plan the flyby for New Horizons. And it was recognized that in 2017, there would be three occasions when PT-1 would pass in front of a star, creating what's called an occultation. So the starlight would be blocked and the star would wink out. Now, because we know the positions of stars very accurately, we would be able to pin down the exact position and the exact time of this event. And that would help us to be able to 
track the orbit of PT1 so that the intercept by New Horizons could be uh, established. So the first attempt was for the, the 3rd of June 2017, and the shadow, the occultation shadow of this star, would be detectable from both Argentina and South Africa. And so teams were sent out to try to spot the event, but I'm afraid they didn't see anything, which was a disappointment, which suggested that perhaps the uh, object was either a, a very small or that it was a swarm of debris rather than a single solid object. Um, or, of course, they were in the wrong place, which is the one that's not listed on there. So attempt number two was set up. And that was to use SOFIA, the Flying Ob Infrared Observatory Telescope, a converted 747 with a big window on the side that had an infrared telescope. And being infrared, it could be extremely successful at high altitude. And that's at the whole point of the flying observatory to get above all the clouds and all the water vapor. And the reason that they used this was because the intercept point was over the Pacific. So this flew out from New Zealand and tried to intersect the proposed track for this occultation. And they didn't think they'd found it until later when they got home. They found a very brief dip in the light just at the end of the uh, observations. So they almost missed it. But having just caught it, that enabled them to be uh, better armed for the third and final attempt at an occultation seven days later. And that was only visible in Argentina, but this time they took no chances. They took 24 of these Dobsonian telescopes, 16 inch Dobsonian telescopes, uh, much beloved of amateur astronomers, actually, these de devices. And uh, they set them up in a trap, a fence line, a picket line, across the projected line of advance of the occultation. Um, and having spread them out over four and a half kilometers, they were pretty sure that the eclipse was going to occur, that the occultation was going to be visible from one of the telescopes, uh, it, regardless of the accuracy. And this would help enormously. And it did indeed work. They caught it. Five of the telescopes actually caught a dip in the light. And the white lines are the tracks of the star going across the field of the individual telescopes laid out in the pattern that they were deployed. And what you can see is that at certain time, the light disappeared from the second one from the top and then reappeared again. It was blocked for longer for the ones below that. And then final one at the bottom, there was no blockage at all. And so what this suggests is that actually the shape was roughly what is shown there with those two circular outlines, uh, which could be made to fit the uh, observations there. So here's the actual detection. You have to watch very closely, but the star in the middle suddenly disappears. Here it goes, there, it's gone and back again. That's just a video taken by one of the telescopes. And uh, with that, you definitely get this idea that it's a two-lobed object um, sandwiched together, perhaps one 20 kilometer and one 18 kilometer. And that shape would not be unusual because if I superimpose on there, the image of Comet 67P, of gerasimenko that the Rosetta mission went to and orbited around it. Well, you can see that's the sort of two scoops of ice cream joined together structure of a comet nucleus. And this seems to fit the idea reasonably well. So armed with the orbital data, nice and accurate as a result of these observations, they were able to target New Horizons towards it. And on 16th of August 2018, from 172 million kilometers away, we got these images here 
uh, with two different cameras showing the object. Now, the reason there are so many background objects is that this direction was the direction of the star clouds of Sagittarius. So this was not an easy thing because there were an awful lot of other stars in the background because we're heading straight towards the bulge of the Milky Way galaxy in this direction. And uh, so absolutely packed with star images. So you had to try and pick out the one that was moving, but of course the spacecraft is moving as well. So fairly tricky. Anyway, at 5.30 in the morning on the 1st of January of 2019, the flyby occurred and it was just three and a half kilometers above the surface, giving a pretty good resolution with a pixel being a 30 meter square. Um, now at this distance, just over 43 astronomical units, well beyond the orbit of both Neptune and Pluto, the uh, light travel time is six hours. So it wasn't until 11.30 in the morning before the data arrived to say that the spacecraft had completed the flyby and it then started dribbling back its data over a very tenuous radio link at that distance. Um, and in fact, the whole data downlink took a year. But uh, the first image to come in was spectacular. And this is it. This was taken as it was approaching uh, and it was at just a distance of 85,000 miles now. Um, now that's uh, um, something that New Horizons would accomplish that distance in two hours. So had it smashed into the, the object, we would never have known because uh, it would have been a bit of a problem with sending the data back. But anyway, indeed, it confirmed this double lobe structure of the object. So uh, confirmed what that occultation data had been interpreted as. And as the uh, flyby went on, we've got a whole series of images of the object rotating as a animation and a series of frames there to show it. And you can see how the animation actually gets noticeably more detailed as it spins round. That's because it was getting so much closer during that time. Um, so uh, you, the resolution is going up as New Horizons is hurtling towards the target. Here it is uh, just rocking backwards and forwards, um, you, just a, a pair of frames uh, again, with quite good detail on them. And you can see some interesting features already there with the neck and some brighter marks and some curved lines and so on. Here it is as a single frame of one of the highest resolution photographs. So you can see the double lobe. There's a big crater on the top on the smaller lobe. And then there are some sort of circular markings on the main body. And with the combination of these images, it was possible to work out really that the shape is not two spheres, as had originally been suspected, but it's actually quite flattened objects, one very flat disc, and another slightly fatter disc, just touching, giving us that uh, interesting shape. And what we think has happened is that uh, during the early days of the solar system, so over 4 billion years ago, material out in the Kuiper belt was whizzing around and gravity was gradually coalescing the lumps together, sticking them and building larger and larger pieces. Larger pieces have stronger gravity and they will uh, attract more objects. And so eventually we ended up with these two objects and then they spiraled together and became what's called a contact binary, still spinning around the center of mass. Um, and the reason that the orbits spiral in is because of a combination of tidal effects, collisions with other smaller bodies, and drag from just the rest of the gas and debris that the, the objects were moving through at the time in the early formation stage of the solar system. And so we ended up with this uh, rather, two rather flattened disks each of which had just come into contact and stuck. Um, and so you've got this very peculiar and very interesting shape. Now, you can see some features on that there, image there, but if we have a look at a, an image and a colorized image, 
picking out the details based on spectroscopy data. So not just the pure color, but looking at the different wavelength absorption and emission features in the spectrum of the light, we find that these uh, objects are indeed made up of a number of regions. And so these are early building blocks that underwent earlier collisions and then got squeezed together. Um, and the whole thing looks like it's been made out of a lump number of sections of plasticine or blue tack um, and pushed together, which is not actually a very uh, wrong impression of it, because this is quite a ice rich, icy, low density body with not a lot of strength. So even with just its modest gravity, it can uh, pull these rocks and start to uh, form them into this uh, disc shapes. And that confirms a lot of our theories about how these outer solar system bodies formed and indeed how the cores of the asteroids and the planets probably formed in the inner solar system by this accretion into lumps and the lumps then accreting to each other and building larger and larger bodies. And I've just got uh, one more shot for you, which is the parting shot animation taken by Ultima of Ultima Thule, now renamed Arrowcoth. Um, and uh, that's its, now its formal name. So they abandoned the use of uh, Ultima Thule or PT-1 or MU-69. Uh, and this is taken by the New Horizons spacecraft as it was disappearing off out. Now, we, I'm not sure that we've heard the last of New Horizons because there is the possibility that it still has a little bit of fuel. And just the other day, there was an announcement that they were considering trying to target it on yet another object. So that would be really interesting. And uh, with that, thanks very much for listening.